Welcome to Taiwan Talks. I'm Betty Chen. Chinese President Xi Jinping, Russian President Vladimir Putin, and other leaders from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization SCO member states convened for a summit in Kazakhstan in early July. The SCO, comprising China, Russia, India, Iran, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, welcomed its first entirely European member, Belarus, at this year's summit. This marks the second meeting between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin within three months. We turn to our guest experts to analyze President Xi's use of international organizations to demonstrate his influence and the underlying implications of these actions. Joining us today are Charles Wu, National Zhengzhi University Department of Diplomacy Chair and Professor, and Courtney Donovan Smith, political analyst specializing in Taiwan. A warm welcome to both of you on the show. Hi, thank you. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, SEO, founded in 1996, has expanded from its original five member states to 10 total, welcoming its newest member, Belarus, at their recent summit. The organization's initial response was to address border issues among member states under the Shanghai spirit. So let's start with today's conversation. Professor Wu, what role do you think that this organization play on the international stage? And also, according to some Western Observer, they think that this organization, SEO, is a so-called perplexing organization as it is neither a military alliance like NATO nor is it characterized by the economic or political integration like the European Union. So what kind of purpose or what kind of role does the SEO wants to achieve through um, the lens of Xi Jinping? Uh, yes, we know the SEO uh, used to be called the Shanghai Five when they first initiated is uh, China, Russia and w with another three uh, Central Asian countries. Uh, then they started to, you know, invite more members coming, like uh, 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 like uh, India, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, and then Belarus as a tenth members. And people are, like talking about whether the SCO is a kind of quasi alliances or we call it, uh, you know, security alliances hosted by uh, China and Russia. Uh, I think it's more than that. Okay, uh, uh, first thing is because China is a non-alignment movement, uh, they don't want to have uh, officially strategic alliances right now. However, they view SCO as a very important regional, uh, we call regional security uh, uh, partnership. Uh, especially, they're focusing on the anti-terrorism first, and then expand the function of SCO to more, for example, uh, like uh, the energy consumption issues, uh, cultures, uh, economic activities, uh, people to people exchanges, and also China use SCO a very important kind of regional. Uh, organizations to stabilize, we call the, the kind of their backyards. So, uh, like what I say, uh, people are like w uh, f closely looking on the China's and also its relationship with SCO. However, we need to pay attention to uh, the, this time, this summit, because uh, Xi Jinping also mentioned that uh, facing kind of external influences or interference, uh, he urged the member state in these organizations to consolidate the power of unity. Okay, uh, I think it's one thing because the geopolitical issues, the uh, Ukraine war, okay. Uh, Xi and also the Putin, they are facing more challenges from outside. And this is why when the two big powers leaders are uh, facing more kind of challenges, they want to uh, encourage the members in SCO uh, to kind of try to stabilize the regional uh, orders. I think this is a very important thing. And second, we need to see uh, the China's and also Russia roles in SCO. Because we know SCO is, they have two language, official language, one is Chinese, one is Russian. And also the headquarter is built in Beijing. So which means China is the kind of, you know, kicking engines in these mm -hmm. uh, organizations. So uh, no matter, I mean, how many members they join, I think uh, the role and also China's, we call the grand strategies, or, or we call their diplomatic strategies, are very important. Uh, you know, the, the issues when we study the SEO. So thank you, Professor Wu. You talk about a unity as well as external factors influencing China and Russia as well as this is an important platform for China and Russia to work together to influence the Central Asian country. So Donovan, why are the Central Asian countries important to the, um, say, China and Russia? And they see this platform as a collective dialogue with Central Asia. How does this work? Well, <clears throat> I mean, historically, uh, Central Asia has been kind of the crossroads of empires. Um, so it's not even just China or Russia 
uh, that has a major st strategic interest here. It's really been on four sides that you've had uh, that this area has been a playground of empires. So of course, obviously, the Chinese through various empires came up through East Turkestan into that region. The Turks, there's a uh, Turkish languages are spoke through the region. Uh, the Iranians, uh, there's Persian languages. So everything from Alexander the Great, there was the Silk Road, the Mughal Empire, um, <clears throat> and these countries plus Turkmenistan, uh, which is not a member, um, were integrated into the Russian Empire in the 19th century. Um, <clears throat> and then of course you had the great game between the British Empire from the south with Afghanistan and Tibet kind of in the middle there, and then China within East Turkestan. So th these players have all, you know, this has been a, um, a territory that has been fought over for a long period of time. And especially at a time when land traffic was a lot safer than obviously you couldn't fly previously, and maritime routes before the Suez Canal were not very reliable or very safe. So these were e extremely important trade routes. It's also important to remember that these, uh, both the the uh, both Russia and China, have a very territorial mentality. Um, I think that you know, uh, from Taiwan or from the United States or the UK or Japan, we're more maritime trade oriented, mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> we look at say a country like. Uzbekistan or Kazakhstan, and they're landlocked countries. They're hard to trade with. They do have, uh, uh, you know, large cotton resources and uranium, for example. So they're important for some um, minerals, and natural gas is a, a big factor going into China. But for uh, land-based empires, they still tend to think in terms of land territory, not so much in terms of trade opportunities. Um, but <clears throat> these are still relevant because there's a pipeline that originates in Turkmenistan uh, that goes through Central Asia into China, and that's a major source of natural gas. Mm -hmm. So, um, and of course, since the Soviet Union collapsed and these countries became independent, there are still, um, uh, particularly in Kazakhstan, there's a large um, uh, Russian minority still there, and there's smaller Russian minorities in the other countries there. And there's a lot of Tajiks, for example, work in Russia. So there's still a lot of mm -hmm. ties between, you know, what used to be the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union and Russia. But now China's the dominant economic player in the region. Um, China, I mean, Russia's economy is about the size of New York City's. It's, it's tiny compared to mm -hmm. China's. So you have these two competing things, but I do think this is an important talking shop because while they don't actually do much except fight terrorism, that is apparently mm -hmm. one thing they've done quite well. Um, <clears throat> but I do think that the side conversations that happen here are probably the most important thing that they do besides probably fighting terrorism. Mm -hmm. So you, both of you talk about the importance of fighting terrorism, which is the key message that is being mentioned in this conference. And also, Professor Wu, you talk about this is a particularly important meeting because this time I think people are looking. Indian Prime Minister uh, Modi, he did not uh, present, uh, personally attend the uh, meeting. Instead, he sent his foreign minister, who also represented him, to say that the most important thing about this meeting is counterterrorism, which kind of like subtly criticizing the role of China China and uh, Pakistan. So Professor Wu, what do you make of this message? And given the border conflicts and the U.S. attempt to strengthen the ties with India, has the India-China relationship officially deteriorated? Or do you think that this is too, too, uh, too strong a word? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> India-China bilateral relations, love and hate, we can say that, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, even, even India joined the SEO, so they play, still play a kind of role in these regional organizations. Mm -hmm. But this time, uh, Modi didn't come. Uh, but their external affairs minister, uh, Josh Hanker, he attended, and he had a meeting with Wang Yi. And mm -hmm. I, I, I watched the, the, their, uh, the, uh, the conferences. I think they both they tried to both, you know, settle down and use more kind of, you know, uh, cooperative, uh, less intensive terms to communicate with each other. They try to seek in common ground while keeping differences. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but uh, like I say, uh, uh, India when they view SEO, they still using kind of lukewarm, lukewarm attitudes. For example, last year uh, India was the host for the summit for SEO, but they use what they use a the virtual meetings, uh -huh. not the people to people meetings. 
And uh, even after the meeting, they signed it called uh, uh, the, the, the New Delhi Declarations. But they mentioned that they kind of, you know, they are not you know, really support the, new, the, the SCO, especially uh, when China proposed a BRI. Uh, mm -hmm. When China proposed BRI, there's one project with Pakistan, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> this is why, why I say it's love and hate. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to cooperate with uh, China. They want to build kind of, you know, economic relation with China. However, they have border issues. And China also BRI cooperate with India's big enemy, <laughs> Pakistan. So uh, this is why uh, last year the summit was, not, you know, people say it was a kind of partially successful. Mm -hmm. uh, but like this year, uh, Modi uh, d also didn't join the SCO. Uh, one thing we need to look at is because from geopolitically or geographically, India is not like directly or geopoli geographically affiliated with Eurasia because they are separated by Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second thing is China and India, like what I say, there's still border issues that compete against each other in several aspects. And also India is like, you know, looking for American uh, security assistance. They, they also have, you know, cooperated with uh, Japan and also uh, other Western powers try to contain China's influences. So like I say, uh, it's still need to see how far India can go with SCO and how, what kind of influence India can provide to this regional organizations. Mm -hmm. Professor, we just talked about the love and hate relationship. And actually, instead of going to the SEO, Prime Minister Modi of India actually paid a visit to Russia shortly after. And also, it seems that the um, India, while trying to improve its relations with the United States, and you can also see that China is working very hard to deepen its relationship with Russia. So this timely visit for Pres uh, Prime Minister Modi to visit Russia, what's the strategic aim behind this trip? And does he want to ensure that Russia remains neutral when it comes to whether the border controversy or other kinds of conflict between China and um, India? Donovan. Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> now, as we're recording this, um, Narendra Modi has just arrived in Russia, mm -hmm. so uh, we don't, you know, we're, we're not, we don't have the benefit of hindsight right. to see what they talked about here. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as a guess, for some of the reasons that they went there, possibly the border issue with China is is, is a topic that may come up. Um, but I think that. I don't know if I characterize this as strengthening the relationships rather than it's maintaining it. <clears throat> because uh, through the whole, you know, through the Cold War, India was a big figure in the non-aligned movement. And so they had pretty good relations with the Soviet Union during that period, while also maintaining pretty good relationships with some in the West as well. Um, and to, the, to, the, to this day, that's still kind of what's going on. Um, also, kind of quietly and <laughs> very low key, uh, the West has kind of been using India as a pressure valve um, in international oil markets. So when um, Russia invaded Ukraine and they put in all these sanctions, Russia continued to buy um, Russian oil at a discount, um, and the West really didn't say much about it. It was sort of a gentle chiding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and. The reason for this is if you take only a few percentage points off of the global oil markets, the price increases exponentially. I mean, it just goes right through the roof. Mm -hmm. So what's happening is, is that India, by soaking up the Russian oil that moved off the market, means that um, it basically just shifted the trade flows of oil rather than diminishing the overall supply. Mm -hmm. And then what India is doing is they can then turn around and turn, they can process the petroleum into things like fertilizers and plastics and then re-export it to Europe. So a lot of Russian oil is actually getting mm -hmm. <laughs> to Western countries mm -hmm. via India. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Biden was facing the midterm elections at the time, so he wanted to keep the oil prices down. Um, I think that uh, of some very important issues that I think uh, uh, Modi would like to discuss with Putin uh, currently, they're importing 65 billion, and these are the latest numbers I was able to come up with, 65 mm -hmm. billion U.S. Uh, from Russia, whereas Russia is only importing 4 billion. Um, and considering that uh, India is a big powerhouse on things like pharmaceuticals, that's, that imbalance is pretty striking. Um, <clears throat> another issue is um, that although India has been rapidly um, 
increasing the amount of armaments and, uh, and weapons systems that it's purchasing from countries like the United States, and there's a lot of talk now of uh, Japan and South Korea buying from them. Uh, about five years ago, two-thirds of India's weapon systems were imported from Russia. It's down to about one-third now, but that means that still about 60% of India's uh, weapon systems are still Russian made mm. and these systems need spare parts and they need the ammunition for them and you know and maintenance and all of these things here so they still have a deep uh, even though it's it's diminishing fairly quickly they still have a deep relationship with the Russians when it comes to weapon systems but it is worth noting that they're now buying a lot more weapon systems that potentially could integrate with NATO going mm -hmm. forward, mm -hmm. which I think is something that people are not paying as much attention to as I think they should. Yeah, thank you very much for, for highlighting these important factors like the numbers regarding the oil and also the weapon system. So that is really important message. At the SEO summit, the spotlight was on a meeting between President Putin and President Xi Jinping. Putin told Xi the relationship between China and Russia is closer than ever. And Xi stressed that Xi also agreed and stressing the need for stronger, comprehensive strategic coordination between their countries, uniting the global south and avoiding a new Cold War. So this show of solidarity in their second time in three months highlights the significant challenge to U.S.-led Western alliances. So so does this hint at rising U.S.-China tensions? So Donovan, you already explained to us the complicated ex uh, relationship among these countries. Could you please tell us a bit more about the, the alliance between Xi and Putin? Will that pose any significant geopolitical challenges or can that serve as a counterbalance to Western alliances? Well, I, I don't think it's, te it's technically not an alliance. Um, the only country that uh, China has an alliance with is North Korea. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> now, you'll notice that, uh, you know, it, it does counterbalance in a sense, but only in a temporary sort of way in that they are, they serve as outlets for each other's goods. So there's sanctions on Russia. This means that they can export some things into China, which they couldn't otherwise. However, it is important to note that the majority of Russia's previous uh, oil and gas exports, and this is particularly important when it comes to natural gas because pipe, using pipelines is a lot more efficient than turning into liquid natural gas, mm -hmm. putting it on a ship, and then going all the way around mm -hmm. the Horn of Africa, which is not a very effective way mm -hmm. to get it. And they have the One Power of Siberia pipeline uh, going into China. And a lot of Russia's oil and gas is actually in the West directed toward Europe, and they can't get a lot of it you know, into China. Um, mm -hmm. But it, there is, they can still get in some. So they're helping each other with uh, you know, sanctions, mm -hmm. getting around sanctions, reducing reliance on Western countries. Mm -hmm. um, for the Chinese, reducing their reliance on the Strait of, of Malacca is important mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's a choke point right. for where a lot of their energy and food comes in. Um, but. The, the, it's really important to keep in mind, while they've done a few military exercises together, their militaries aren't interoperable. Um, their militaries have very little experience working with each other outside of a few exercises. Their weapon systems are, are only partially compatible. Um, and I don't know if either one would go to war to help the other one. Obviously, the Chinese are not going to war to help, you know, to help the Russians in Ukraine. And so I don't I feel like this is a very temporary alliance because historically these two countries do not trust each other mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that Vladimir Putin, he still thinks in Soviet terms when the Soviet Union was the big brother in the relationship, mm -hmm. but now the Russians are the little brother mm -hmm. in this relationship mm -hmm. and I'm sure he is not happy mm -hmm. about that. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, don't, I don't know how long this is going to last. Mm -hmm. I think that both countries' syst political systems are very brittle. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they could come apart tomorrow mm -hmm. or in 20 years, but mm -hmm. I think at some point they will. Mm -hmm. And if either one of, uh, you know, and they, or they could turn on each other. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, these are the kinds of systems, because they are brittle, th if they do fall apart, it'll happen, you know, slowly then suddenly is the mm -hmm. expression usually used in these mm -hmm. situations. So based on your observation, the, this is a very brutal relationship between China and Russia, as you have described. Do you think that a joint efforts between China and Russia will be able to counter or to fight against the uh, U.S. dominance or the domin dominance by the Western countries? Professor Wu. Yeah, you know, um, 
uh, Putin just visited China in the early May, and this was the, uh, their 43rd meetings for mm -hmm. the past mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. and also marking their 75 anniversaries of China-Russia diplomatic relations. So we can see they try to speed up their kind of bilateral relationship, or we call the new strategic partnership, uh, very quickly. Okay, because we know that uh, after Mao Zedong, as uh, Deng Xiaoping, they mentioned about the non-alignment movement. Uh, they try to start, you know, not building kind of called security alliances, but uh, they have different definitions and different types of strategic partnership. But we, when we look at the Sino-Russian strategic partnership, they are different from others. Mm -hmm. uh, they build a different kind of strategic partnership in different times, at least three different eras. Uh, this time, uh, Xi Jinping and Putin they mentioned about the new era strategic partnership. They are starting from the military, uh, you know, kind of. Co mutual corporations to economic corporations, and they also try to mention that they oppose outside interference in Russia or in China's internal affairs. So I think this is a very important landmark for mm -hmm. the bilateral relationship when Xi Jinping and Putin uh, build up. Mm -hmm. Second thing, especially when uh, Ukraine war occurred, uh, Western powers try to sanctions on the Russians' productions, mm -hmm. but only I mean China started to you know, do more business with China. Uh, there's data shows about 46 to 48 percent of production sanctioned by Western powers they are imported by China. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing we need to know that uh, you know who pushed these two <laughs> great powers <laughs> together. This is the first question we need to know. Right. Since don't even mention that in history, Russia invaded China. They mm -hmm. have border issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And the unsolved border issues, you know, last between the two countries for a long time. So Chinese people, Russian people, they are also have love and hate too. Mm -hmm. So I mean, uh, but when you're facing kind of external challenges, you are putting you put the two 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 great powers together. So like social network analysis, if enemies enemies your friend, <laughs> then this is what we see uh, Xi Jinping and Putin they speeding up their battle very quickly and intensively. So like I say, uh, one thing we also need to pay attention is during the 2022 the Winter Olympic Games. They also mentioned there's no limit partnership between these two countries, mm -hmm. which means probably they were moving toward a kind of quasi alliances or even a secure alliances in the future, facing the international s structures, international societies uh, change if there are more kind of external threats. Mm -hmm. So this is my final question, because now the U.S. presidential uh, election is around a corner. And the, according to the recent debate, it seems that President Trump, former President Trump, has a very good chance of winning the second term. So if Trump gets reelected, how will that affect the complicated relationship, say, uh, U.S. relationship with uh, Russia and with China? What's your take on this, Donovan? It's really hard to predict. Um, <clears throat> I, I saw an interview with uh, former National Security Advisor John Bolton. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about uh, President Trump. He said that he had been talking to him um, and they had decided uh, in response to something that the Iranians had done that they were going to conduct a, a military strike. Um, <clears throat> and he said he went back home to get a change of clothes and by the time he'd come back, Donald Trump had changed his mind. <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit hard to predict. Um, right. Now, Eldridge Colby, I saw, just came out the other day and said that he expects a, Trump in, uh, a future Trump administration. He's also tipped possibly to be um, the national security advisor under a future Trump term, if Trump does indeed win. Um, he's, he argues for a pivot from Ukraine to Taiwan. Um, but then Taiwan famously compared uh, Taiwan to like a tip of a, 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 a pen or a marker, Sharp mm -hmm. a Sharpie. Sharpie. There we Sharpie. go, Sharpie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How could I forget? He loves Sharpies. Sharpies, <laughs> the weather right. map. Oh, <laughs> <on the> table. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so uh, you know, I don't really know how, what uh, you know what uh, Trump thinks about Taiwan. Uh, my suspicion is he's more anti-China than pro-Taiwan. Um, I think that his administration before was very good for Taiwan, but I, I don't think it was necessarily a, so much a credit to him as to the people in his administration, like Bolton, like uh, Pompeo, Navarro, these people who, uh, particularly Pompeo and Bolton, who are very pro-Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Navarro, mm -hmm. I think, was more anti-China than anything else. Um, so it was these people, I felt, that within the administration that, were, that really helped push along uh, Taiwan-U.S. relations. Mm -hmm. 
how much, again, credit goes to, to Donald Trump himself is really hard to say. Mm -hmm. We know that um, Trump is very unpredicted, but we look at President Biden in his term of office. He's also very proactive in promoting diplomatic relations with countries around the world. So how do you view the diplomatic competition between the U.S. and China? Do you think that what's going to happen before the presidential election? Oh, Wu. So there are some patterns we still can learn mm -hmm. if Trump got, you know, win mm -hmm. the elections, his diplomatic or foreign policies. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think he has good communication with all, all those authoritarian regimes. They're buddies, right? <laughs> 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 he knows Love how to communicate, right, right, exactly. <laughs> communicate with those people, right. leaders, mm -hmm. uh, because he don't put the values of dem democracy as the, you know, the mm -hmm. high level. Mm -hmm. as he's Biden. a businessman. Mm -hmm. he, he's right? deal maker. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so the deal maker, when he uses deal maker to deal to, to talk to those authoritarian regimes, uh, he has his way. Yes. But uh, like I say, uh, Biden different. That Biden used we call the hub and spoke, use democratic values, mm -hmm. and this we see a kind of split of war. Right. One is Western powers, one is anti-Western powers. Mm -hmm. So like I say, uh, in the future, China or Sino-U.S. relations, still because uh, no matter Trump or Biden win, who, who wins, the anti-China or can content China strategy will still maintain mm -hmm. because uh, first. Uh, we call content China is now is consensus in the United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. no matter it's, uh, bipart it's bipartisan yes. consensus. Mm -hmm. Also, mm -hmm. if we look at domestic polls, mm -hmm. American people's view on China is changing. Right. More than 70 people, 70% 70 of people, American people, they don't have that friendly views on mm -hmm. China. Thank you very much. That's all the time we have for today. If you like our show, please search for us on YouTube. Give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching our show today. Stay safe and see you next time.